and the co-founders. <laughs> I'm Jody Evans, one of the co-founders of Code Pink and um, coordinator of the local peace economy uh, project here at Code Pink. And before we start, I just wanted to, you know, recognize that today is 9-11. And, um, you know, for me, it was a day that, you know, really changed the world forever. The uh, comfort, it seems, that we have with war and weapons escalated on steroids since that day. But, you know, it's also the day of the coup uh, in Chile. And it's also um, one of the first days of the Zionism entering Palestine was in 1922 on 9-11. So it's a big day, this 9-11 day. And why do we remember these days? Um, we remember them because we're human and we're remembering is, is difficult because so much is happening. But to remember, you know, what choices were made, how they happened, you know, what we can do with our lives so they don't happen again, what we learned from them, um, and, you know, what others learned from them that we need to learn from that process. You know, it's, um, so uh, this war economy like went into a, like a whole steroidal explosion um, after 9-11 in, in 2001. And it's part of, it, it is where Code Pink was birthed out of. Um, and, you know, we, we came to life the next year, about a year later, but it didn't, that was after trips to Afghanistan. And, um, you know, then the shock of that 9-11 would not only be uh, an incursion into Afghanistan, but also Iraq. So I just want to take a minute for us all to just stop and think about where we were, um, what is different even about us from 9-10 to 9-11 and these years that have followed. And then also just how long change takes. Um, if we think of what happened and who we were then and who the country was then and what we thought about, and then what the issues are now and what has changed and and how it's the drip, drip, drip of these changes that are both the ones that break our heart and the ones that we are the drip, drip, drip up that open, you know, that, that nourish our hearts. I just think it's always good to know about change and how it can be triggered by something, but the outflowing of it takes time. And here we are at the, you know, engaged in two wars, you know, one trying to start uh, a trillion and a half dollars of our tax dollars being spent on war, uh, Zelensky dragging us into trying to bomb Russia, uh, the, you know, Biden just being a total lost human that he can't even show up for a United States citizen that was murdered by Israel. So fully owned, our government fully owned by another country, which the um, the meshing of means, you know, <laughs> is, is even hard to understand, you know, so the psychopathy that arose out of us not being able to take 9-11, grieve, listen, try to understand what we needed to listen to, but instead react out of violence and madness that's driven by greed and power. Yes. Just wanted to take a minute for us to sit in that because the peace economy and this work was also born out of understanding that that's the war economy and that's how it reacts and um, that we are cultivating the peace economy, but maybe we didn't pay enough attention to for the last 20 or so years, but we are now. Um, so, uh, Emily. Thanks, Jody. Welcome everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Emily. I'm the local peace economy coordinator at Code Pink. And just wanted to let you know that put some announcements in the chat, but don't worry about signing all the links now. Um, they'll all be in the follow-up email. We'll take take good care of you. Right now, we just need to be together, be present. 
And to do that, we're going to do some grounding. Um, if you've been here before, you know we always start with grounding. And tonight, we're going to do an embodied practice as we move into talking about our relationship with the land. Um, for me, um, this this topic really and, and being in relationship with the land really requires us to be present and be present in our bodies and to the world around us. So we're going to drop into some presence together. So you can do this either sitting down or standing up or lying down, whatever is best for you today. Um, and so we'll start just by feeling our seat wherever um, our bodies making contact with the seat or maybe the ground below us with your feet taking a few deep breaths into our belly. And this practice came um, from Stacey Haynes and the generative somatic lineage that um, she teaches. And it came, this iteration came to me um, through my dear friend, Javon. Just wanted to learn that, but. So first we're gonna ground in um, three directions, our length, our width, our width and our depth. So first we ground in our length which our length is where we find our dignity. So feeling your length from the bottom of your feet to the crown of your head, extending towards the sky and the earth at the same time, and feeling everything in between along your neck and down your spine, through your hips and down your legs. And in our length, we feel our dignity. And our dignity was not given to us and therefore cannot be taken away. And next we find our width, which is where we find our connection with all other beings. So maybe feeling the edges of our body from our left to our right, across our shoulders, across our ribs, across our hips, along the edges of our legs. Maybe even making yourself a little broader to feel into your width, widening your shoulders maybe, extending out, and feeling even beyond the edges of your skin, as if you could extend your energy out to touch who and whatever is around you. And in our width, we remember that we are connected to all of life, to each other, to community. And next we find our depth, our front, back, and all the space in between. And our depth is where we find our history. So we'll start by feeling into our back body, feeling into your back, the back of your head, the back of your legs. I know this this part is often challenging for me. I have a hard time feeling my back body. Our back holds our past, our triumphs and our challenges. It holds the wisdom we've gleaned from our lives and the ancestral wisdom we carry. Remembering that we can lean back into our back body, into our past, into our ancestors when we need support and rest. And then we scan forward to our front body, feeling our face, our chest, our stomach, all the way down our bodies. Our front bodies hold our futures, where we are headed, our dreams and our aspirations for the world we want to live in. And then feeling into the space in between our back and front, which is the present, the space we take up right now and all that it holds, our tissues, our bones, our heartbeat, and feeling into our heartbeat for a moment together. And now feeling into our length, our dignity, our width, our connection, and our depth, our place in history, all together, taking a few deep breaths to feel our expansiveness. We extend our hands towards the ground, touching the earth, maybe just energetically, maybe physically placing your hands on the earth if you're low enough, and bringing to our minds and our hearts something that comes from the earth, from the soil, from below that we're grateful for. Maybe you're grateful for a favorite flower or a certain plant. Today I'm grateful for basil and fennel. And holding that gratitude in your heart space as you call something that comes from the earth to mind. And perhaps also calling in gratitude for the original caretakers of the land that you're on, the indigenous peoples who have lived in reciprocity with the land since time immemorial. If you know their names, you can say them to yourself. And if you don't, you can still hold gratitude for them and the ways they've cared for the land that is now caring for you. So where I am, I'm grateful to the Arapaho, Ute, Cheyenne, and many other tribes whose ancestral homelands I reside on. 
And now extending your hands to the sky as you're able, <coughs> calling to mind something that comes from above that you're grateful for. Perhaps that's rain, snow, sunshine, whatever it is, taking a deep breath in and feeling your gratitude in your heart space, saying thank you to what comes from above that nourishes us. And now we extend our arms and hands outward to our sides. And here we call to mind someone or maybe someone that we're grateful for, a relationship in our life. Remembering that we cannot exist and thrive without our relationships, without our community. Giving gratitude for someone who nourishes you by their presence. And finally, bringing your hands to your heart or another place on your body that feels nourishing, maybe one hand on your heart and one on your belly, maybe resting on your leg. And as you feel your hands on your body, giving gratitude to yourself for all the ways that you show up for yourself, for your community, for the earth, for life itself. Taking a breath in, filling your belly and your rib cage, and letting that gratitude expand to fill your whole body as you exhale. And as you're ready, coming back into your space, feeling your body in your seat first, opening your eyes if they were closed, taking a look around to or orient yourself, and then coming back to our collective space in the Zoom sphere here together. Mm -hmm. And here we all are. Um, thank you so much for grounding and centering with us and with me. Um, that's a really nourishing practice for me. So thank you. Please take care of your body as you kind of come back, stretch, get some water, whatever you need. And if you saw in the RSVP or reminder email, we invited you to bring along to the call something that supports you in feeling connected to the earth. So I have this little acorn that I picked up on a walk recently, so I'll have that with me. And the invitation is simply to have that item with you during the call and maybe afterward as a place to return to if you feel your attention going elsewhere, or if you're needing to feel more anchored to this moment we're in together or anchored to the earth. Thank you. Jody. Thank you, Emily. I always feel so good when you ground us. And they're always so different. So we never know what we're going to show up for. Thank you. Um, and that work, by the way, the somatics work is in the um, the caring compassion section of um, the website. Uh, if you want to go back and, and learn more there. So um, I thought we should just check in. And see, you know, uh, last week we worked on limitation to imagination. If anyone wanted to share, if something came up for them there, if they're in your works between in these last two weeks, did you learn anything? Were able to work with it? Um, did something arise for you? And also, I just wanted to see if there's anybody new. If you can raise your hand, we like to welcome you and just. Um, if you're new, please. Uh, oh, I just saw a hand. Um, Jess, and I saw another hand. And L. Okay, so Jess, L, Ali, great. Let's start with you. Um, so if you could just introduce yourself, where you're from, and your curiosity about the local peace economy. Hi, everybody. My name is Jess. I use she, her, and they, them pronouns. I'm originally from Nashville, Tennessee, and like I have place-based connections in Olympia, Washington, and Anchorage, Alaska. But I'm back in my home state living in Lewisburg, Tennessee, which is a rural community about an hour south of Nashville. Um, I don't remember how I came across the, the peace economy, but I have been doing some um, kind of systems change work in community with other people for a number of years now, and it just really resonates. And so there's something really special and sacred about remembering my own lowercase i indigeneity, my own place-based connection to land and people. And um, this just, it, I'm interested in regenerative and solidarity economies and, you know, helping humans survive in right relationship with each other and the planet into the future. That's why I'm here. Thank you. Yay. Welcome, Jess. Um, Elle, uh, is it Ellie? Yeah, it's Ellie. Ellie. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Ellie. I'm a student in New York City, and I was doing the Summer of Love for Gaza, and I, I found the 
uh, local peace economy through your guys' website. And I love everything Code Pink does. Being in New York, um, I've been like a lot more attentive and I just wanted to join today just to experience more of what the actual community feels like. And yeah, I, I'm trying to read more about it because it's really for me. But, yeah. Cool, thank you and welcome. Gordon. Yeah, hi. I've been a supporter of Code Pink uh, for some time, but I haven't done anything online uh, with them. And so this somehow this struck me as a good time to come on. So I live in Newbury Park and uh, uh, I'm active with the um, uh, Chalice uh, Unitarian Universalist Fellowship uh, of the Canal Valley and uh, really appreciate what uh, everybody's doing. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Um, so, um, Marlena, uh, if you don't want to talk, that's fine. Uh, thanks for being your first time here. And if there's anything you want to share, we will let you, but there'll also be other time. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave that up to you. Okay. And um, Megan, did you want to share anything? Because you're, you're new. Um, <laughs> Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Megan. I grew up in Maine, um, but I'm in D.C. now. I'm the China's Daughter Enemy campaign coordinator, and I've just been admiring Emily's work with the campaign from afar for a while, and I thought I would like to join one of the calls and, and meet the community. Thank you. And um, also just, you know, one of um, Megan's campaign is engaging locally with our um uh, with Asian communities because, you know, with the war on China, uh, there's a lot of violence that has, you know, the, the casualties out of the U.S. trying to go to war on China and making it an enemy are in the United States and in our communities. So, um, you know, being able to build a community relationship um, with the Asian communities near us is, is one of um, her activities. And this weekend, she's going to a... Um, What's it called this you're going to this weekend the, with the lanterns? Uh, we're having a mid-autumn festival community day. The mid-autumn festival is a really big holiday in China. And so the local Chinese community um, always has uh, different events going on. And, and we're going to be doing some art projects, some fun art projects with the local community. Yeah. And um, so, I, you know, it's also a good way to be in the local peace economy habits. Um, because they're very indigenous to Chinese culture. Uh, you know, there it's a way, you know, when we look at what the, the addictions of the war economy are, those 23, very centered and grown out of the US, where in China, they're more centered in the peace economy habits, the not separation, living in community, collectivity, you know, they're, they're so it's, when, when we say the you know, the best way to learn is to be in relationship with already existing local peace economies, that's a place where um, a, the connection would be um, much easier than uh, some others. So thanks for joining us, Megan. And then did anybody want to talk about um, anything that arose for them from last week, from limitation to imagination? I don't remember, last two weeks ago too far to remember. <laughs> uh, if there's nothing um, that anybody had that came up for them, uh, we'll just move it back to Emily to take us into our relationships with nature. Thanks, Jody. And yeah, if, do, if things do come up um, between calls that you want to share, um, you can always share in the Peace Economy listserv and that link is in the chat and will be in the follow-up email as well. So it's a great place to continue the conversation. But yeah, so today we're reflecting on our relationship with the soil, with the earth, with what is still wild. I was really excited about this topic. And part of the reason um, we wanted to share with this topic is because it's kind of come up a few times in the last several calls. Um, so we wanted to dive into it a little bit more deeply. And the workbook and the website, uh, the Peace Economy website and the Local Peace Economy workbook, both start with this idea of returning home sweet home. And when we talk about returning home sweet home in the peace economy, we're talking about returning to the earth, returning to right relationship with the earth. The war economy has tried to sever us from that relationship 
and makes the earth a resource or a commodity to be used and extracted from. But we can cultivate a deeper relationship with the earth, even amidst the war economy, because it is our birthright. We don't have to wait for it to fall. And in fact, we can't because it is in the act of coming back into right relationship with the earth that we're going to create the future that we want to live in. So part of this work is remembering that whoever we are, that we come from people who lived in connection and reciprocity with the land. It may have been generations and generations ago, but we all have that in our history and our story of survival. And that does not at all erase or flatten the struggles of indigenous people here on Turtle Island or wherever you are and the need to be in solidarity with them, nor is it a claim of indigeneity. I wanna be really clear about that. And in remembering that we also come from the earth and have ways of living in connection with it in our history, I think it can open up space for more authentic solidarity with indigenous peoples. And if you don't know whose native land you're on, I included a link where you can find out in the email about this call, and I'll include it again in the follow-up email. Um, and so I think Jody wanted to share a story with us before we go deeper. Cool. So um, also just, um, this kind of came out with Emily and I talking about this in the sense that, um, you know, so a lot of us are very privileged and have access to nature. I would even say that our access to nature brings us to local peace economy because we've already been imbued with it. It's already a relationship that feels familiar, but, um, you know, in the cities and and with those who have few resources um, that live inside of cities, the access to nature is really anemic. And I had the experience uh, like 30 years ago of um, taking um, about, I, I took five um, young kids, uh, you know, maybe six to 11, um, at, they were the children of my friend from Watts up um, to Ashland, Oregon. We drove up, um, you know, to Ashland. And what I didn't realize is they'd never really been out of Watts, like not even to the beach in, in LA. So you can imagine like when um, I get to Mount Chasta and throw them into a lake, it's frightening. It was just frightening for them. Everything about the adventure was frightening. And um, the place I was taking them to was my platform in the middle of nowhere in the forest. And they'd never seen, it had never been that dark. They'd never been, you know, in that many trees that were frightening. So to go a trip where my heart lives in nature, in, in the dark so that I can see the stars. I mean, like literally made this platform in the middle of nowhere so I could lay down and see stars because I live in LA and it's, I feel like I'm, you know, abused of, of no stars. And that that was it, like to not know stars, you know, to not, and then on the way back, I took them through the redwoods. I have a very favorite place with a river and which I call my cathedral. And they were so frightened of these giant trees. Now, by the end, um, one of the oldest boy ended up going to Humboldt State because he got so moved by the experience, you know, a, you know, and was like a black student up at Humboldt State. But I just, you know, that when we talk about this to also realize even our own privilege, given that, you know, where some people live and how some people live, that the war economy has taken um, a lot of people away from uh, their relationship to the land and including, you know, one of the things we work at with the local peace economy is moving money into black farmers and indigenous communities being able to have their land back. Um, well, you know, I forgot the number, but it's some 20% of farmers um, at like in, eight, in 19, 1880 were black farmers. And that's like now I think less than a percent or some very, very low number. So also having the land taken from you, you've driven away. Um, I just wanted to bring up the, the privilege um, in this moment as we talk about the privilege of being able to relate to nature um, as, and, and that part of the violence of the war economy is actually ripping that away from some. 
Thank you, Jody. So in the email that went out on Sunday, um, I shared one practice that I've been working with to cultivate a relationship with the earth. And it's really simple. It's called a sit spot. And in the practice, you find a spot that's accessible to you that you can return to often and that you go there consistently and sit. And sit can be broad here. It can be stand. It can be laid down. It can be dance, move, whatever you feel called to. But the intention is to um, return to that spot and open your senses to what's around you. The sounds, the colors, the sensations, maybe even the energies and the emotions. So I'm very fortunate to live near a park and I've been going there to sit under these two evergreen trees pretty often. I go there when I need rest. I go there when I need guidance and support. I go there to just be and to remember. And I try to remember to bring them an offering, something from the earth, like an herb maybe that um, I finished working with, or maybe just some water from my water bottle. And I sit. And over time, I'm cultivating a relationship with these trees and observing um, all the life around it, all the bugs, all the birds, all the other humans, all the plants. And as I'm being with what I'm noticing, I also feel really witnessed by these trees, too, as I'm witnessing them. So it's not a place, so it's a place not only of learning and listening, but also of refuge and care, which I think is really, really important um, when we're talking about returning to the land and cultivating a relationship with the earth. And there's nothing that I have to do with this practice. I don't have to take it and turn it into something tangible. Maybe you do if you just choose to engage with this practice. You want to bring a journal with you to document either writing or drawing what you experience, what you notice but you don't have to produce something from it. That's just more war economy thinking. That doesn't mean it won't lead you to something or that something might not emerge from it organically, but making something from it is not the goal. That can be another way of being in an extractive relationship with the earth, which is what we're trying to pivot away from. So I wanted to share that practice with you all. Um, it's been on my mind as one way of many to cultivate a relationship with the land in our daily lives, especially as the seasons change in the coming weeks. Um, obviously, it looks different for everyone, depending on where you're located. Um, but as we transition to autumn, this practice can really offer a lot. As you witness the land changing, what does it teach you about change, about loss, about grief, about letting go, maybe letting go of war economy ways of being? So having a sit spot is just one practice to cultivate a deeper relationship with the earth. But there are so many, um, as many as there are people on this planet. So I'd like us to gather some of these ways together so we can have them to return to. So I brought another little um, item with me today. I have this basket, you can see, hopefully. You might be able to see it's a little lopsided because I made it and it's the first basket and only basket I've ever made. Um, but I'd like to imagine, I'd like for us to imagine that we can gather some of these ways that to relate to the earth together. Um, Imagine that we're going foraging in the forest together. We're going to go out in small groups um, and gather these ways. Um, so that's what we're going to do in our breakout rooms tonight. Um, we're going to go out into the woods and talk about and gather the ways that we can connect with the earth in our life or ways maybe we'd like to deepen our relationship with the earth. And when we come back together, we'll fill this basket with all of these practices that we can share in collectively. Um, Let's see, I'm just making sure there's something in the chat that needs to be attended to. So the, well, I'll put the breakout um, room question in the chat. It's how do you connect with the earth? Where do you connect with the earth? And how does it nourish, nourish you? And the, yeah, the goal is to kind of have these to come back to you. Um, that way, if you're feeling a little lost, or disconnected, we can kind of, um, I don't want to say brainstorm, I'll say heart storm these ways together. Um, so I'm going to make nine groups and ev everybody knows to click to go in the room. Um, if I don't see a room full, I might move you. Um, so don't be shocked. You might get moved a little bit in the beginning. And um, Emily will post the questions in case you forgot. We'll see you on the other side. And we'll have 15 minutes, so please just keep time for yourself to make sure everyone has a chance to 
to share. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. And if you can please uh, just mute yourself to minimize feedback during the group share, you might be unmuted coming back. Um, hope you had some good conversation. Oh, everyone's tumbling in. Um, welcome back, everyone. Just a reminder to mute yourself again as you come back. And before we uh, move into our large group share, we're going to um, take a Zoom photo as a group um, to <laughs> update our our photo on our uh, Peace Economy website. So if you're willing to come off camera for this, that would be much appreciated. <laughs> um, and if you want to, you know, throw up an emoji or a peace sign or a heart or whatever you want to do. So I'll take a couple and I'll tell you when. Okay, ready? Smile, three, two, oh, I love the balloon. Three, two, one. All right, and we'll do one more, just for, just in case, all right. Uh, three, two, one. Awesome, thank you all so much, really appreciate it. Um, great, and uh, we're gonna move into large group shares, so we'd love to hear what you talked about in your groups, what ways that you connect with the earth that we can kind of collectively heartstorm together. And then I'm gonna put that in the um, in the follow-up email that goes tomorrow, goes out tomorrow. So that way people who weren't able to join too can can learn from the collective wisdom in the space. So um, somebody asked about a peaceful, can I, oh, uh, Craig. Um, Craig, I just wanna, I'm gonna post in the chat um, the Ikvin um, Yekvaluja, uh, um, it's a uh, Muskogee community that I, uh, out of the local peace economy has arisen from an idea into a form that is now 4,000 acres and has two of the eight living buildings on the planet. Uh, I mean, peaceful, peace economy. I mean, what I love is like everything they make, they can tell you what they decided to build with and all the decisions they had to make to find something that wasn't violating the earth or uh, extracting from another indigenous culture. I mean, it's a really, really fascinating place. Uh, Marcus Briggs Cloud is quite brilliant. So, you know, it's, it's just amazing. But I also wanna say, I got to pet the sturgeons that they're bringing back from extinction. And in that pet, like as soon as I touched it, my whole body started crying. Like I felt life at a depth that I had never, ever, ever, ever felt before. And it was like that sturgeon is one of the oldest, um, you know, uh, remaining things that old on the planet. And I had a profound experience. So that's one. And then I wanna say another one that I'm just discovering is in Mendocino, California, where the commons wasn't destroyed. And so it's a little different. It's, you know, but it's got, you know, old co-ops that are part of it, like the art center and the, and it still has, you know, a yearly concert, a year, you know, monthly plays, a local choir, the community co-op. So it doesn't, I'm not saying like everything is all local peace economy, but it is infused with it. And it still has a commons, which has really reminded me. You know, I say philanthropy uh, is more devastating than capitalism because it doesn't have any governors and it makes people crazy. But it re just reminds me that when there used to be excess, it was spent on the community and created the commons that everyone could partake from. So there's many, many buildings and spaces and things that were created that anybody can use and for whatever they're doing. And uh, just a reminder in a city of 800, um, kind of what that felt like and still feels like and how different it makes the people that live there. So that's the answer to that question. All right, so let's take some raised hands on how we add to Emily's basket. <laughs> okay, Jamie, yay, we get to hear from Jamie. She's new to the... Um, the group. Hi, Jamie. You got to unmute. 
There, you there go. we go. Okay. Um, hi. Um, we really like the trees. We really like um, actually going out to the tree and, and telling the tree what we need and giving our problems to the tree. Um, we just like staring and, and just looking at nature. Um, some of us were lucky enough to be near parks. So we go to the parks. Um, Joy was saying how she likes to um, go to the farmer's market to get the vegetables there and, and the food there. So that's part of her local economy and, and, and being connected with the community. Um, just, yeah, just go, just being outside. I think a lot of it is just... Great. Thank you, Jamie. Yes. Reminding us just to be in the sun. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so that's, a, that's a good reminder about being in the sun. And then also really good reminder about our food and how close can we get it to the root um, that it, it arose from. Thank you. Really good reminders. Thank you. Um, Jess. We had a great conversation. Also love trees. Um, I sort of shared just my experience uh, and conscious decision to live rurally. So I was more, uh, had more access to earth. Um, and so we kind of talked about that tension of like, you know, urban, you might have access to like, it just like it's anyway, wherever you live, it seems like you're having to make some sort of a sacrifice, but at least I feel like in rural, you have more access to green space, but then if you don't have as much access, ha having that be really intentional. Um, uh, and then Chuck, I don't know if I can share your story, but um, he, per thank you. He provided a really beautiful metaphor talking about um, water. Um, and was it Lake Huron? Cool. I got it right. Um, going to the, the, you know, confluences of water and um, watching this, like the raging water. And even among the raging water, there, there, there being pockets of still water and sort of um, that call to mind, just metaphor and how nature is a very much a metaphor for life. Um, so that can be really resonant. And then um, Ali talked about the relationship between animals and humans, specifically pets. And so then we kind of got into this interesting exploration of, you know, how people treat animals um, poorly and sort of, so we were just sort of chatting about that, but then also the benefit and like the joy that, you know, we experience being around um, companions, furry companions. <laughs> That's a good one. Thank you for that reminder. Um, Marilena, Marilena. Marilena, yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yes. You can hear me. Okay, so um, I talked about um, holding crystals um, because uh, so that's what I'm holding during our gathering today uh, and how they're, they mean a lot to me. And then also um, walking a labyrinth is a way that I connect with the earth. And I shared that there is a website called the Labyrinth Locator. Um, and I used that years ago when I was traveling and I got to walk a labyrinth in Spain and I got to walk two labyrinths in Amsterdam by connecting with people who had registered their labyrinths on the Labyrinth Locator. Oh my God, what a great thing. Thank you for that. I love that. You're welcome. I love walking the labyrinth. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. New tool to add. Thank you. Um, Rachel. Hi. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm driving, so I'm um uh I connect by connecting teenagers. I'm a high school uh teacher and I grow food with them. So I um I um I tell people that a hundred percent of my salary used to come from just teaching Spanish. And I transitioned my economy because I made up a couple of classes, horticulture and environmental engineering. So I literally get paid to do something that I, I put in about the environment. So I've just had so many cool experiences with, with kids locally growing food and, and just, you know, we're, we're planting little seedlings and, and one time they had a, just the most tiniest, tiniest little cauliflower seedling. 
and they would not let it go. They just had to find some soil for it. And it's just, it's so precious. And I'm, I'm very open. I, I, I radicalize my kids um, in the classroom. And I'll just say that this local peace economy is so important because when my kids leave my class or they graduate, there's, there's nothing for them. And we have to, we have to make these opportunities for them. Yes, thank you. And save them from the war economy. <laughs> you bet, you bet. Well, like always, our, our time together is flown. Um, you know, my deepest gratitude to everyone uh, uh, for joining us, uh, for being together, for all of you new ones, uh, welcome. It's where we come together and just try to connect in the, sanity, in the insanity of the world to reground our commitment to the peace economy. Um, uh, deepest gratitude for who you are and how you're serving life and the future. Um, Emily? Yes, thank you all so much for coming. And yeah, keep an eye out for the follow-up email tomorrow. There'll be the links that and other resources shared um, in there that we talked about tonight, as well as the link to and I'll put it um, I'll put it in the chat real fast um, to register for our next call, which is on the 25th. So if you don't already know this, um, our peace economy calls happen every other Wednesday night at this time. So we hope to see you there and continue the learning with you. And I put in the Evkin Yevkolevev, uh, the Muskogee place. I think, um, and we'll put it, you know, in the follow-up email. But it is a place to look at. Um, I take uh, I, I take billionaires there to show them the difference between the world that they're destroying and the world that is possible, and it's a whole other culture. Um, so, uh, you know, the thing about this is that this is happening. You know, as you look at the website, there are thousands of of things birthing. So, you know, it's to have that. You know, we don't even need to have hope. We can be related to it. It's happening. The experiments are happening. And even as we see the devastation and the violence that we're seeding the future and it is beautiful. And it when we do it, it is beautiful. So it's not the future, it's the moment. Um, mm. So thank you for, for everything and we'll see you in a few weeks. Take good care of yourselves and your community. Peace thank and love. You. Good night, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And Jess, thanks for- Thank you. Thank you. you. Yay. <laughs> the justness, yay.